chapter 4. This is where I, w- I was not going here tonight. There's another passage that I was going to go to because really this verse is just to kind of help us to get started with the subject uh, that we're looking at tonight. But in Sunday school, uh, Brother Max said something that, that made me think about this passage. And I looked over at it and I said, you know what, that'd be a good place for me to begin uh, this evening. And really what we were talking about was just some, some kind of some dumb things that people say. And uh, I mentioned one of them today uh, in, in the morning message where you, know, got, you got the Jewish leadership says, well, we're Abraham. See, we've never been in bondage to anybody. I mean, what are you talking about? You're in bondage right now. You're, I mean, you're constantly in bondage. Well, another one is not, not lost people this time, but it's something that some saved people said. And really my message has nothing to do with that, but like I said, I went to look at that area and I saw something. I was like, you know what? I think that would be a good place to start tonight. And so I asked you to turn to John 4. Look at verse 31. John 4, 31 says, In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. Now, to give you the idea of what's going on, uh, his disciples kind of, they left him for a little bit, and this is when he meets the, the, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. He speaks with her, he talks to her, she realizes, you know, her sin, and she look, realizes who he is, and she gets excited about that, so she goes to tell the other men in the city, you know, about, about this person that she just met, this wonderful person named Jesus, and so while she leaves, the disciples come back, and, and they, they say, hey, master, you need to eat, but he said to them in verse 32, I have meat to eat that you, not, that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, hath any man brought him aught to eat? And they, they just, they got, I mean... <laughs> Who brought him meat? I mean, that's kind of, just hold on, guys. Just hold on. Just hold on. He said, therefore said the disciples one to another, If any man brought him all to eat, Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. And see, really, that's the point that I'm trying to get across. Verse 34, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his, his work. And uh, so Jesus, he talks about this work that he's supposed to finish. And by the way, he did finish that work. He finished it, and we're all fruit of that this evening. The title of the message tonight, before we pray, is Don't Be a Lame Duck. Don't be a lame duck. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for tonight. I thank you that we've heard some wonderful testimonies tonight. Uh, Some of them were kind of funny to us, and, and just not that we're making light of how good you are, but just... How you, how you look after us, you know, in ways that a lot of times we don't even think about. And so we thank you for that, Lord. And we also thank you for this one that is surrendered to, to full-time ministry, Lord. However you're going to lead him, Lord, we're, we're thankful that we can be a part uh, of that, that, that there's going to be fruit down the road that you're going to use him to produce and, or that you're going to produce in his life. And yet we've had a part in that through being being friendly to him and by, by praying for him and by counseling him and just by being there for him, being an encouragement and an example. And I pray, Lord, that we'd be those things. And Lord, I pray that you would use this message to remind all of us, not just him, but to that the importance of finishing strong and that we will do that and not be a lame duck. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Most of the time, when we think about a, a lame duck, we, we do it in political, we, we think about politics, we think about a lame duck president. And that's, you know, when, when, a, say when a president, when he begins to lead and he's able to, to accomplish things or he wants to do some things because maybe he's got the House or he's got the Senate or he's got both of them, but maybe his decisions is not the best, maybe politically it goes south for him and he becomes unpopular. And what happens in the midterm elections is that his party loses and they lose big. And it's either what we call a blue wave or a red wave. And so then the, the rest of his presidency he, can't really, he really can't do much of anything. We call that a lame duck presidency. And that, that's not an uncommon thing. That happens ever so often and really where they can't do very much. And it's like, like as far as being like a lame duck, you know, like a lame duck, have you ever seen one? I don't think I've ever really actually seen a lame duck. I've seen a duck without a beak before at Disney World. But that's about as close as I've ever, ever seen anything that was weird about a, about a... Well, I saw a duck that had like three legs one time too, so I don't really know what you call that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Is that a super duck? I, mean, you did, I don't really don't know what you call that one. But, but a lame duck is one that you really can't fly or can't fly well. Or maybe it's in the water. It's kind of throwing some water around, but it's not really going anywhere. And so that's kind of how the president is. It's kind of, you can't really do anything. You talk a lot. You're throwing water all over the place, but you really can't, can't do anything. Uh, and so 
they have that high accomplishments, but eventually there's really just, like I said, not much uh, to do. Now, the reason why I mention it is that we can be lame ducks as well. It's not just something you can apply to politics or presidents. Is that we can be, you know, through our own fault, we can be put in a situation where we're, we're throwing water all over the place, but we really can't, can't do anything. We're just flapping around. But that's not how we're supposed to be. We're supposed to finish strong. You know, recently there was a decision made to, to give God all, to surrender every part of, of his life to my, to my brother Ronnie over here. We're excited about that. We want him to do, do good right now and, and, and learn more about what God wants him to be and take what he's already learned throughout his years growing up in, in good churches and, and having a, a good godly home. We want to see him do strong, be, be strong now, but we, want to see, we don't want to see him fizzle out. And see, that happens a lot of times. People get all fired up and they, they get started and then they, they, they don't finish strong. But see, we're supposed to. The, the verse that I was going to, going to go to to start with tonight was 2 Timothy 4, 7. It's, a, it's a, a normal area to go to when you talk about this. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. That's what Paul did. He finished his course. He finished strong. Jesus, he says, you know, I, I came. Uh, my meat is to do the will of them that sent me and to finish his work. Jesus did that. Jesus finished strong. Uh, Paul finished strong. We know others in our lifetime that have finished strong, but we also know those that have not, that have fizzled out, that have even fallen away, that have turned their back on the things of God. We have a lot of examples of leaders, of Christians failing at this. We have them in the Bible as well, and that's what I want to look at tonight. I want to look at one of these that did not finish strong, and that person is King Asa. I want you to go to 1 Kings 15. Of course, we're not going to do a biography of his entire life. That's you know, going to be more than what we're going to look at. But we're going to briefly you know, summarize his life. King Asa. Now, King Asa is not one that we probably remember a lot of times. As far as kings go, we remember some of them. David, Saul, Solomon. We may remember Rehoboam and Jeroboam. We may remember uh, Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah, Josiah. We may remember even Zedekiah, the last king of Judah. But King Asa is one that we don't think about a lot of times. King Asa is the third king of Judah. Uh, kind of remind you of things. If, if you remember, there was the whole kingdom, the United Kingdom, Solomon's king over everything. He dies. Rehoboam becomes king. Rehoboam is not a very good king. He makes some bad decisions, listens to bad counsel. And what happens is, is his kingdom is split into two kingdoms. He, he remains king of the southern kingdom of Judah, the capital of Jerusalem. Uh, and then the northern kingdom will be, you know, the king of there will be Jeroboam. And he will, you know, and then from now on, you got these two kingdoms. Well, after Rehoboam dies, his son, Abijam, becomes king, and he's only going to reign for three years. And then his son is going to become king, and that's the man we're looking at, King Asa. Now, Asa is going to reign for, for 41 years as king for a long time. He's going to start off real strong. He's got a good family heritage. I mean, not so much with his, with his dad and his granddad. That's uh, Abijam and Rehoboam, but his, his great-grandfather was Solomon. And his great-great-grandfather, of course, was King David. And we read about King Asa, his life, in 1 Kings 15, where we are. We also read about it in 2 Chronicles chapters 14 through 16. We're going to look at that a little bit tonight. But if you want to study him a little bit, little bit closer, 1 Kings 15 and 2 Chronicles 14 through 16 is the places to go to. But in, re in regards to him not finishing strong, as I said, that's, that's the premise already to begin with, that he doesn't do so. But to begin with... He starts good. He starts right. He's in a right place. And that's where we're going to start with number one. He did correct, and God made it calm. So number one, he did it correct. He did correct, and God made it calm. A lot of the chaos that people have in their life, I would say probably the, the majority of the time, is brought on by themselves. They brought this in their life. Well, King Asa, to begin with, he doesn't have a lot of chaos because he's doing right. He's serving the Lord. Look at, uh, look at verse 9. It says, In the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, or that would be the northern king, reigned Asa over Judah. That's the southern kingdom. And 41 years reigned he in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom. 
And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. Now, of course, David is not his biological father, but when it's talking, they, they really didn't have words for grandfather like that. When it means David his father, it's talking about, of course, he's of the lineage of David. He's technically the great great grandson of David. But so Asa did right in the eyes of the Lord, like David did. Remember, David is a man after God's own heart. Verse 12. And he took away the Sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his father had made, that his fathers had made. And also Maacah, his mother, even her he removed from being queen because she had made an idol in a grove. And Asa destroyed her idol and burned it by the brook Kidron. So he's kind of cleaning up some of the mistakes of his father and of his grandfather and even of Solomon as well because Solomon kind of messed up and allowed some things to come in. But he even did something more personal. He, he removed his own mother from, from being the queen mom. I mean, he, he did that because of the idol that she had. So he's doing right. He's making the right decisions. And the, the result of that is God's going to bless him. And the way that God's going to bless this king, and this is the greatest way probably to bless a king, is to give him rest from his enemies. We read about that in 2 Chronicles 14, 6. You just write it down, check it out. But let me read it to you. 2 Chronicles 14, 6 says, And he built fenced cities in Judah, for the land had rest, and he had no wars in those years, because the Lord had given him rest. He had rest. He had a, a calm reign as king. And why is that? Because he's, his, his heart is perfect before the Lord, because he's serving God. And once again, a leader in their right mind does not want enemies. Does not want conflict. Uh, I mean, that's why, you know, someone, I don't want to get off on this, I promise you, but we see, I, I like giving examples of the day. Someone like President Putin's not in his right mind. I mean, there's just something not going on right there to, to go in and have this war. And he's got his, his reasons, and we always justify our reasons for what we do. But at the same time, that's a lot of chaos and conflict in his life that probably didn't have to be there. Uh, from, my, from my perspective, of course, I don't know everything, but from my perspective, he did not have to have this conflict that's going on. A leader in their right mind doesn't want all of that. A leader in their right mind wants rest. And so God gave him that rest. And even God gave him something besides rest. God's going to give a revival. You read about that over in Second Chronicles, how revival breaks out in the land. This is a good time. But as you already can imagine, this good time's not going to stay. We get to number two. He, talking about King Asa, he began to compromise and God sent conflict. He began to compromise and God sent conflict. Now, this is your mom we're talking about in verse 13. That you're willing to go against your mom. Your mom. Now, that's a big deal right there. So you're kind of thinking, hey, this guy right here, he's willing to do whatever. Unfortunately, that's, that's not the case. Because in verse 14, it begins, but. Now, whenever you see that word, it's an important word in the Bible. It means now we're changing directions. He's, he's, he's removed these bad things, the Sodomite side of the land, all that that his fathers had made. He's removed his mom from the throne because of her false idol. But, verse 14, the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Ace's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. So, he didn't remove the high places. That's a mistake. That's a big mistake. He's compromising. Now, why is he compromising? I do not know. Maybe one of some of his counselors, maybe some of the rich people, uh, whatever. Maybe he doesn't see it as a problem, but he's compromising by allowing the high places, the worship there, to continue. And probably he's making the mistake that a lot of well-meaning, sincere believers make to this day. Their, their heart is per perfect before the Lord. They're not getting entangled with things that are not right, but they're compromising those things. They don't really see a problem with it because the way they look at it, well, we know they're worshiping in high places and they're not supposed to, but they're worshiping Jehovah there. So that, that must mean it's okay. No, it's not okay. See, whenever you start doing something the wrong way, eventually you'll start doing the wrong thing. That's the way this works. They're not supposed to worship there at the high places. What they're supposed to do is they have a place to go and do the ceremonial things there at the temple, there in Jerusalem with the ark, with the temple, with the holy instruments, all that. That is the place where they're supposed to go. Now, this is not saying you can't worship anywhere, but those ceremonial things were only supposed to be done there. But they're doing it in high places. Now, the reason why that is bad, even though it's the right God, the reason why it is bad is because God says, don't do it there. Don't do that. And so he's compromising. 
And what maybe he doesn't realize is he is eventually, when you compromise in those small things, eventually they're not going to worship Jehovah in those places. They're going to worship false gods. That's what it always led to. The worship of the high places always led to false worship, and that's what's going to happen. And so he's trying to play both sides. He is not going to the high places, but he's like, well, I'm sure it's probably okay. I'm sure God, the big guy upstairs, is probably going to be okay with it. So that's where we start compromising. Even in ways like I just said, the big guy upstairs, that's compromising God's a holy God. We don't refer to him as the big guy upstairs. No, we refer to him as Father, as Lord, as God, as Master. We don't refer to him in that way because, well, see, that's not that big of a deal. When we start compromising in the small things, then we start having problems. That's what happens to him. He began to compromise God's sins conflict. Look at verse 16. And there was war between Asa and Baasha, king of Israel, all their days. Now, up to this point, we read about rest. He had no war in those years, is what the Bible said in 2 Chronicles 14, 6. And now, after not getting rid of the high places, he and Baasha, king of Israel, have war all their days. So he's doing a good job, but then he starts to compromise. Compromise is not a bad thing in itself, and sometimes compromise is a good thing. In marriage, at times, there has to be compromising. But when it comes to our convictions, we cannot compromise our convictions. A conviction is something that you're willing to die for. Are you willing to die for it? Because if you're not willing to die for it, it's not really a conviction. There are some things that you should be willing to die for. That's a conviction. When it comes to principles, you, you, sh- you cannot compromise those. A- and your principles should come from the Word of God. You cannot compromise the Word of God. That's what he was doing. He was compromising the Word of God. And so he began to compromise God's in conflict. Then we get to number three. This is my last one. He became conceited. And God allowed complication. He became conceited, and God allowed complications. Let's go to 2 Chronicles 16. We're going to finish up over there in that section. 2 Chronicles 16. <clears throat> Usually when we start compromising, the reason why we compromise is because deep down we think we know more than God. That's just the honest truth right there. When there is compromising, whether in your life or in the church or in your home, the reason why you do it is because ultimately you think you know better than God for your situation. You're like, well, God, I know the situation of King Asa, or I know the situation of Paul, or I know the situation of Moses, but my situation, my circumstances are are different. No, if the Word of God worked for them, it will work for you as well. It may be different verses that you need that they needed, but that it's all the same. So he begins to compromise, he becomes conceited because of that, and now complications. More so than conflict, now there's going to be some complications. Look at verse 1, chapter 16. It says, in the 6th and 30th year of the reign of Asa. So we're talking about to the end. Remember, finish it strong, don't be a lame duck here at the end. In the 6th and 30th year of the reign of Asa, Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah to the intent that he might let none go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. So Baasha is being threatening right now to Asa. Baasha's there and he's kind of bullying him. Then Asa brought out silver and gold out of the treasures of the house of the Lord and of the king's house and sent to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, that dwelt at Damascus, saying, There is a league between me and thee as there was between my father and thy father, Behold, I have sent thee silver and gold. Go, break thy league with Baasha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. So you see what he's doing here. King Asa thinks he knows better. Instead of going to God about the problem that is King Baasha, what does he do? He steals from the temple of God to give to a foreign king, the king of of Syria, and say, come here with your army and fight my enemies for me. Well, Ben-Adad, the king of Syria, the one that's being paid, this, this stolen money, verse 4, and Benadad hearkened unto King Asa and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel and they smote Ijon and Dan and abel Maim and all the store cities of Naphtali. And it came to pass when Baasha heard it that he left off building of Ramah and let his work cease. Then Asa, the king, took all Judah and they carried away the stones of Ramah and the timber thereof wherewith Baasha was building and he built Therewith, Geba and Mizpah. In other words, it worked. It worked. King Asa, what he did in his conceit, by and off an army, it worked. At times, 
Now, I want you to listen to what I have to say. At times, our conceit, at times, our compromise actually accomplishes something that we want. It does. Does it make it right, though? No. It doesn't make it right. Just because you got the outcome that you were wanting doesn't mean that it was right. And a prophet of God is about to explain that to him. In verse 7, at, And at that time, Hanani, the seer, and seers is another word for prophet, came to Asa, the king of Judah, and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of those of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Because you trusted not in God, but in this, this other king, you're going to have wars. You're going to have problems. He even says that you were supposed to pretty much take out the king of Syria. Eventually, this people that you armed, that you paid, paid to come and destroy your enemy, you were supposed to take them out. Now you won't. And by the way, the kings of Syria are going to be a thorn in the sides of Judah and Israel from ye for years and years and years after this. When we are conceited and we will compromise, guess what we're going to have in our future? Conflict, thorns, uh, complications, problems after problem after problem. But wait a minute, wait a minute. It worked, remember? It worked. It worked for a little while. But when we do things the wrong way, eventually it's going to catch up with us. And that's what happens here. Now, of course, King Asa doesn't like it. You would hope that King Asa, being a godly man when he was younger, would say, oh, my goodness, thank you, preacher, for coming and telling me this. And he would bow you know, his knees before God and ask God forgiveness and say, God, what can I do? Does he do that? No. Verse 10, then Asa was wroth with the seer. He's angry with him. He put him in a prison house, for he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. I don't know if these were aligned with this seer, or maybe they were kind of saying the same thing to King Asa. I don't know. But he starts to oppress them as well. And this is the same man that we read about earlier. That he was like David. That his heart was good. That he, he served God. That, that he loved God. That he had calm and he had rest. And where is it at now? So he locks this man up. He oppressed some of the people. And verse 11 says, And behold, the acts of Asa, first and last, for they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel, and Asa in the thirty and ninth year of his reign was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physician. And Asa slept with his fathers and died in the one and fortieth year of his reign. Even, even through this complication of this disease in his feet, instead of going to the Lord, he went to the physicians. There's nothing wrong with going to the doctor. There's nothing wrong with going to physicians. But we always got to remember that God himself is the great physician. We go to God first. But what does he do? He doesn't seek God. In his conceit, he knows better. And that's the danger of getting set in your ways, of being stubborn. We won't finish strong. And once again, this not only affected Asa, this has affected the people of Asa at, at Asa's time when he's king, because remember, he oppressed some of them. Well, this way, as I've already said, will affect future generations. Why? Because he compromised and because he was conceited. He became a lame duck at the end. He couldn't even walk around really anymore. He couldn't be the king that he once was. So in conclusion, don't be a lame duck. I'm not going to say that we're going to get a, a problem with our feet and we can't walk anymore. But what could happen is, is everything we try to do, it really just won't accomplish anything because we're the lame duck. So be a good leader. Be a, be a good servant. Be... Be a, a person that God can, can use. A, a, a person that God can use doesn't do what is popular or what, is even, what even makes common sense. And by the way, the Bible, there's a lot of common sense in the Bible. I mean, the book of Proverbs is all about common sense. But if the Bible disagrees with common sense, the Bible wins. That's the way that works. When, when the children of Israel are at the Red Sea, when this, the, the largest, army, largest army on earth is coming, common sense says we're all about to die. But God says, no, I'm going to part the Red Sea for you, and you're going to live. So a good leader doesn't do something based on popularity or common sense. 
when they do it, they, they base it on what God said. And that's how we finish strong. That's what Paul did. That's what Jesus did. That's what we need to do. We need to finish strong. Let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight.